but we are you are going to be doing some things in class tonight okay so this is the public speaking class okay psychological techniques should never be used in church and I've heard that when mm -hmm. I first started writing this textbook you should never use psychological techniques that's because they're showing their ignorance because they don't know what psychological techniques are move over oh the door thank you we use them on each other all the time hmm? we use them on each other all the time yeah you use them in, in personal conversation right? psychology classical greek psyche soul or mind logos study of is an academic and applied field involving the study of behavior and its relationship to this mind and brain psychology also refers to the application of such knowledge to various spheres of human activity including problems of individuals daily lives and the treatment of mental illness and many times that's what we're doing okay i don't know if this is going to work for me the adobe is keeps blanking up some uh, advertisement sign up to the next you know spend some money and get the next one and all it does is mess up the old one right. oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah see i'm not even i'm not even communicating here let me reopen it i might have to borrow your book then no problem see if it'll reconnect it's been doing that all night kicking in and out mm -hmm. All right, it'd be easier for me to just use your book and let me reopen this and see if that'll help. It's even the teacher's edition. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> what are you doing with the teacher's edition? Well, you gave me that 12 years ago. I know that. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not going to do it for me here. So... There was something I wanted to bring up on the screen, so I will bring it up because it's what we will be Oops. dealing with mostly. Okay. Oops, 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 Now Okay, let me open this up and then we'll get on. Okay. Beautiful. That is what I wanted on the screen. Okay. Left hook. Hmm. You want to left hook? Page 20. Yep, page, page 20. 20 in your textbook. Oh, okay. Okay. Page 40. I thought it was page 40. I thought we were 42. Yeah, it's 42. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to go through this tonight because it seems somewhere struggling with the outline. Oh, yes. I think page 40. We can do the outline. And that's about all I can get on there, so. But it's enough that you can work with it. It's supposed to be dark. Yeah, one. We're going to go to the outline page, mm -hmm. which was page 20 in the one I had. And hopefully it'll be the same in yours. Yeah. Yeah, 20. Okay, it's not in Daniel, but. <laughs> I'm the one we need. You want my page 20? That's okay. I don't have 20? It's, on, it's not this. Your numbering is different. This yeah. is an old version. I like me. An old version. Yeah, that's because... Oh, I see. Here we go. Are you an old version? Yeah. Yep. You're talking about a true version. Okay, that's all right. We'll just use what's on the screen. Stay, okay, it. just wanted to show you a little bit of how to uh, do some outlines. This may reach over there. It does. I can maybe do it with this. Let's see. Sometimes this will reach that far. Yeah. It's working. Uh, cool. Okay. I'm a mousy guy. Yeah. That's <laughs> slick. 
It's working a little bit, so that'll work. Okay, so the subject or title, then the introduction. Remember the introduction is really a promise of what you're going to deliver right. in the body. The body starts there with point one, point two, point three. Yeah. That's the body. Okay. What about the vertical thing? Uh, actually, yes, it all goes together. The way that God put my mind together is I actually think in outlines. I do. You notice all the textbooks are what? Right. They're all in outline format because that's the way I think. Um, I told my wife that uh, the reason I work with a schedule is it's the only way I can get everything done. Like we're supposed to start now because of a problem I had. Uh, we're supposed to start our exercise at least three days a week. I told her, fine, then I have to schedule in a time. And she said, but will you keep it? I said, if it's on a schedule, I'll keep it. Yeah. All of my sermons are in outline. All the books that I write are in outline format because that's the way I think. Otherwise, I can't get everything done. Right. That's that I need. a block against these outlines. You know that, don't you? Uh-huh. He just doesn't want to do it. Fred? Yep. He's never had to do an outline. He won't. Now, see, this thing's not connected now, so. Oh. Figures. Hmm. Well, it was for a minute. Yeah. Pull it in. Okay, so I'll just get over here. You're right, though. I don't have that thing. If you touch this, that'll open that window. Oh, yeah, see, it's not going to do it for me. I can do it from over here. But I don't think I need to, because outlines are repetitive. If you look there where it says point one underneath, you see where it's capital A. Uh -huh. If you have an A, then there must be at least a B. All right? If you, you say, well, but I don't have two subpoints, then you don't just do capital A, capital B. You just do point one and then write in the statement that you're going to make. Instead of calling it capital A or, you know, indicating it as capital A or capital B. So, uh, can anybody tell me John 3.16? Okay. So, the subject or title could be love, God's love. Could be giving. It could be believing. It could be salvation. You could use that verse for any one of several different speeches, or in this case, a speech, an oral discourse from the Bible, given with a view of affecting a change in the listener. The only difference between a speech and a sermon is, a sermon is given from the Bible, but they're both an oral discourse given with the view of affecting a change in the listener. That's a speech. A sermon is, an oral discourse given from the Bible right. with the view of affecting a change. Okay, psychological ladies. principles. Okay, ladies. That's all persuasion sure. is, are psychological principles. <laughs> and so, uh, whatever you would want the subject or the title to be, the introduction, is going to lead into whatever, if you're going to use John 3.16 as an example of supreme giving. Supreme giving. Why? Well, because he gave his life. Right. So from a human standpoint, that's a supreme giving. In fact, the Bible tells us that uh, greater love hath no man than this, than that he would lay down his life for his friend. But God's love, he laid down his life for his enemies. Mm -hmm. yeah. He died for the ones that nailed him on the cross. Mm -hmm. There's Roman soldiers that nailed him there. He died for the for the uh, high priest and the rest of the Sanhedrin that convinced the Roman government to put him to death, even though they found him innocent. All the two. Okay, so you could you could do supreme giving, whatever you would want to do, and then the introduction. You want that to lead into point one, which then has to be connected to point two. So, can anybody tell me how you might outline point one of John three sixteen? Just say it over to yourself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But what's the first thought in that? He gave. God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. 
So point would, one would be love. Yeah. Or God's love. Yeah. Okay. The A underneath that, B underneath that, for God love. For God so love, A mm. might be the world. Yeah. It might be. But then, if you're going to, uh, he gave, okay, for God so loved the world, that would be point one. You might not have an A and B under there. You might just have a simple statement that you put under there, but don't don't indicate it as A or B. Because point two, for God so loved the world that he gave. gave. So what's point two? Gave. Gave. That he gave. Okay. The ultimate, the ultimate giving. Then under, under two, if you're going to have A and B, that he gave his only begotten son. Well, see, you don't really have a second part to that. Mm. That explains that point completely. Don't make these any more complicated than you have to. So, so far, point one, we don't have an A and B. We just have point one and a simple statement that you might write underneath there. Point two, that he gave, but you don't have really have an A and B. Okay. He gave his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. But see, there's not a second part to that, is there? So you don't have to indicate <laughs> A and B. You just write in, what did he give? You might put that as just a little trigger so that you remember what you want to say next. God's so love that he gave his only begotten son. Then what would point three be? Whosoever believes. Whosoever believes. Yeah. Now you might want to make point three uh, the results of him giving, or that he just gave his only that whosoever believeth in him. But now you would have an A and B under that, wouldn't you? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. A. The results. A, we should not perish. B, have everlasting life. So you didn't have an A and B under point one. You didn't have an A and B under point two. You could probably make one there by referring to some other verses. But we're just going to do a simple one tonight. Now in point three, now we do have an A and B. Whosoever believeth should not perish, but have everlasting life. So you've got a three-point sermon. Point one with a simple statement, point two with a simple statement, point three with an A and B underneath it. Would you call this expository? Uh, yes, this is expository preaching because expository means you're exposing the meaning of the verse or a group of verses, which have whatever you care. We're just doing, this is as simple an outline as you can get. You're just doing one verse, order. but you're exposing and you're putting it in order in their mind so they can realize, hey, it's only by God's love. It's only by God's love. And of course, when you get the, down to whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, you might want to do some cross-references to Romans. Can you? Anybody remember the Romans road? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what does Romans 5, 8 say? God commands his love. Oh, wouldn't that be a good cross-reference to one of them points? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay? So you might get down there to point three. You might want to use Romans 5 8 as a cross reference. Why? Because it says whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, wouldn't that reinforce that third point of just simply believing? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that 5.8 would, would reinforce that verse. It would be a good cross-reference in that, well, yeah, but don't you have to be a good person too? That's not what it says here. So all you got to do is believe. So a good cross-reference is Romans 5.8. While we were yet sinners. Well, that proves that you didn't have to clean up your act. You just had to simply repent and believe. So that would be a very simple outline. 
Don't put A and B under one if you don't have to. Don't put A and B under two if you don't have to. These are to help you, not to confuse you. I've had some outlines that wound up three or four pages, and I went back through them and I went, that's even confusing me. <laughs> and I'd have to go through and cut them down to one page or maybe a page and a half. Now, for something more complicated, if you want to see the notes I'm using on Wednesday night for Romans, most of those one or two verses are at least a three-page outline because we're having to go into not just verse by verse, we're having to go in word by word in some of them. But when I do the Wednesday night thing, you can't tell I've got three and sometimes four pages. Why? Because I'm not going to get the whole thing. It's just to remind me that, oh yeah, refer to this word here because in the Greek it meant that and it's, you know, uh, words like perfect. That's it doesn't mean that's sinless. That's what an outline's for. Yeah. Just to remind you what and that's all it does. And I'll blast through it and I might take this much of one page of my outline and I might actually preach three sentences. In the body? The synopsis. Oh, but it's, I can do that because I've done this my whole life. And every, even with songs, when I, when I was, I never could memorize songs when I was a professional musician. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd have to do a song 10 times before I could remember all the words. I've never been able to remember all the words. So I would take a recipe card and I would actually outline the verses. You know, uh, half of a sentence underneath it. Second verse, mm -hmm. maybe a whole sentence. Third verse, maybe a half a sentence. That's all I needed was to trigger my memory and then I could sing the song. And I had a little alligator clip on my microphone stand. I had an alligator clip taped on there because I wouldn't wear my glasses. I was too vain to wear glasses when I was a professional musician. And so I would have that alligator clip. I could take a recipe card, clip it on the clip, and even as blind as I am, as nearsighted as I am, I could read that because it was right there by the mic where I was singing and I could see it and so I've always had to do that so they were just kind of like a prompt that's all they were were prompts and that's all an outline is supposed to be is a prompt because I might forget that uh, <coughs> have everlasting life so I would do that as B should not perish would be A B would be have everlasting life and that's all I can write in there I just write B would be everlasting life. And that's all I would need to trigger that so that I could remember what I wanted to emphasize in that point. Then when you get down to the conclusion, then the conclusion in this case would probably be a summary. If you're here tonight and you've never accepted Christ as your savior, uh, God says, you know, he wants to save you because he loves you, okay? And he even showed that, how did he show that? He gave his only begotten son. And how do you get saved? Well, it says, you just got to believe. So the summary is an altar call. Yeah. Your summary can be a summary of the points, including your invitation. Okay. So the summary would just remind them, you're only saved by God's love, not by your good works. No, no. There's nothing you can do. Well, I've noticed every time at the mission or anywhere else when you preached, that at the very end, your your invitation, your is your altar call is the summary of the entire sermon. See, at the mission, the preacher boys preach. The different preachers from the church preach. Then I give the invitation. But my invitation is based on my mental outline of what the preacher boy preached that night. And I may add a verse, maybe a verse or two, maybe just to clarify a point. But generally, I don't have to do that. Generally, I can just do a summary of what Brother Fred preached, you know, or, or what well, Brother Sill preached. Brother Fred preached a stereotypical Fred sermon. Yep. If you died today. Yep. And Fred <laughs> cannot get his mind around outlines. He won't. He's got a mental block. Yeah. He just can't. He writes his sermons out. Now, that's fine. To anybody tell me? The preacher that was called the Prince of Preachers? Spurgeon. Spurgeon. Spurgeon wrote every one of his sermons and preached them word for word. He wrote them out. That's Fred's excuse, too. But the thing is, he could do that. 
Uh, just hand, hand me your book a second, okay? Spurgeon could do that because he would be reading through and it wouldn't be, remember you are there to fill the needs of your audience, not to fill your own need. If you succeed in filling their needs, then they will go away filled. If, however, you do not fill their need, then they will go away resentful of that fact. Do your now job and part of the job. Is not, that would bore me to death. <laughs> I wouldn't get through two sentences of that, and you wouldn't hear the preacher because you'd hear me go. That <laughs> just set me. But see, Spurgeon, he could do that. Remember, remember, you are there to fulfill the needs of your audience, not to fill your own need. If you succeed in filling their needs, then they will go away filled. If, however, you do not fill their need, then they will go away resentful of that fact. See, Spurgeon could do that. He could read his sermon and put emotion into it. A lot of people can't do that. A lot of people, when they read, it just gets boring after the first few sentences. Okay? Now, my students online, I tell them, if you want to write out your sermons word for word and preach them that because they're required to preach their sermons. The online students, yeah. I have one guy say, well, well, I don't belong to a church right now, so I don't have anywhere to preach. Uh, I said, are you married? He said, yeah. I said, then preach it to your wife. Yeah. You got any kids? Yeah, I got kids. Well, then preach it to your kids. They are required to preach their sermon to somebody, anybody. If you want to write it out word for word, I told them, that's just fine. But you have to turn it in an outline to me online first. But what if they get saved? Part of, part of the reason for the outline, part of the reason for the outline is to make sure you don't forget a point. Mm-hmm. That's why when you, anything you write, you should outline it first. And then read through it and you go, ooh, I forgot that everlasting life part down there at the end. I got that they shall not perish, but I forgot the part about everlasting life. And so that's what an outline is for, is to help you organize your thinking. When I did my outline, it proved, it proved exactly that. I forgot all my points. And the next week he came in and apologized. Because <laughs> I proved exactly the opposite of what I set out to do. Anyway, I, I didn't, it was ridiculous. So that's why online they have to turn in an outline to me. And, but if they want to preach it from writing out the whole thing, oh, that's fine, whatever works for you. That's what you should do. This is just to help you organize your thinking to make sure when you're writing it out word for word that you get all of it in. It needs to be in there. Okay. Another thing about an outline is if you make an outline, don't make it too complicated. And the other thing is, if you're going to preach it to someone, don't put everything you have into that practice. Because no strong emotion can be sustained for any length of time. That's when, when I do a wedding at the rehearsal. I never take them through the whole thing. I'll take them to, now, do you, Daniel, uh, take Sue? I said, now, when I get and ask you that question, say I do. Because I'm not going to take them through the whole thing, you know, of all of the vows and all that, because the woman is going to be supremely disappointed when it comes to the day or the night of the wedding and she goes, we already went through all of this in the rehearsal last night. What are you doing? Oh, this is no fun. My son-in-law, when I did my daughter's wedding, my son-in-law walked out like this, like a penguin. And right in the wedding, I said, if you don't bend your knees, you're going to fall over. Because that's what they do. They get stiff-legged. And then if they start to faint a little bit or get a little woozy, you're you can't get your balance. You're like your knees. You're yeah, you're going to tip up. over one way or the other. And so uh, the same way with the outline. When you practice your sermon, don't give everything you have into it. Realize that, hey, when I get down to point three, everlasting life, I want to hit that one. I want to hit that one. Why? Well, because the devil's going to come along and say, well, it couldn't be that easy. Well, yeah, it is. Why? Because God said so. Well, yeah, but you can lose it. Well, wait a minute. If you could lose it, why did God lie and say it was everlasting? Mm -hmm. See, if Calvinism, if Calvinism is true, God's a liar. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. Mm -hmm. Calvin said you could lose it. If you could lose it, then that's a lie. It was not everlasting. 
And how many times throughout the book of John do we find eternal life and the everlasting life? And how could that be true if you could lose it? And so, yes, in your outline right next to everlasting life, if you really want to hit that point good, right in there, hit this. Just a reminder to yourself. And then remember to read your notes. <laughs> so make a note at the top up there right next to the subject or title. Make a little note that says, read your notes. <laughs> hey, we can laugh at him all we want. We're all going to do that. We're all going to do that. And so the outline is just to trigger your memory. That's all it's for. All right. So any questions about this? Any comments? I was thinking if you, if you were using John 3.16, could you could you incorporate 3.17? Absolutely. The the world? Yeah, actually I would because uh, I usually use 3.16 through 18 because 18 says that uh, those that do not believe are mm -hmm. condemned already. And then you could go For he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. You do not, and you've heard me do that down to mission. Many times I've said, if you go to hell for your sins, you're a fool. Yeah. And then you're you stupid. Can, then you can go Why? Because he's a propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. So you're going to hell for sins that are already paid for. Right. Yes. And that's foolish. That's mm -hmm. being stupid. I agree. That'd be like that'd be like the judge finding me innocent and I say, No, 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 no. I want to go to jail for two years. <laughs> wow. Now how <laughs> stupid would that be? If someone goes to hell today then they're stupid if they go to hell for their sins because they're going to hell for things that are already paid for. That was real strange. And that's why I always use that verse when I use John 3.16. They that believeth not are condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. When and so we go to hell for not believing in Jesus. We don't go to hell for our sins. We deserve to go to hell for our sins. Right. Part of the critical thinking class. Remember, listen to what people say, not what we think they say. If we say we go to hell for our sins, that's not biblical mm -hmm. at all because they're paid for it. But if we say we deserve to go to hell for our sins, oh yeah, now that's absolutely biblical. But if we say we go to hell for our sins, then that's not biblical. Mm -hmm. We go to hell for not believing in Jesus Christ right. who already paid the debt for all of our sins. So we go to hell for things that are already paid for. God's not unjust. He would only send us to hell for our sins if our sins hadn't been paid for. Something very strange happened that night at the mission. Matthew. In Matthew. He shall save his people from hell. That's not what it says. From their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. Yeah. Okay? So be careful how we word things. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that over and over and over in the years I've been in the ministry. Man, you're going to hell. Look, you keep up those sins. You're going to go to hell for those sins. Well, no, because they're already paid for. They're going, going to hell for hell. not believing and accepting. Oh, yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to go straight to hell. <laughs> Trying to make a point. Or they put Moses in the ark. You know, or Noah on Mount Sinai or something. That's what an outline is for. If you're going to use an illustration, I would write it in. I might write a... A might be a statement of God showed his love, but if I did, then for B, I would use something explaining about God's love. You know, that it's greater than our love. Why? Well, be, and I'd use a cross-reference, because uh, greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Yeah. And then I'd make a comment, God said that's the supreme show of love for a human being is if we would lay down our life for our friends. But God's love's Hebrews, superior, is greater than that. Why? Because he did lay down his life for his enemies. Or you could say, who, who, who's, God, who, who, who's God love? Yeah, you could put that in there. Mm -hmm. And maybe a cross-reference. So you, you understand what I'm getting at here. This is just to help you to jog your memory of things you want to say, and if there's a particular statement you want to make, then write that in as a point. Usually I only write a couple of words. I don't have to write the whole thing, the whole thought, but just a few trigger words to 
remember that you want to hit this point. You want to hit point three. Uh, you should not perish. Okay? But have everlasting life. And then under that B, have everlasting life, um, I might, depending on where I am, I might make a comment about Calvinism. Calvin said, no. doesn't matter what you do. You God decides if you're going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. It's not up to you. Oh, no, now, wait a minute. You. Didn't it just say, if you believe? Yes. You have to believe to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Yeah, Book of Romans. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, meaning everybody. the non-Jew. Everybody. Everybody okay. that believes. So, comments? You look like you're about to say something. No? <laughs> this is as quiet as I've heard Jerry in a long time. Yeah. That's because he's already done his homework. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments, Joe? No. Questions? Comments? Sister Candy? Mm. Comments? That was good. Yeah. She did. She did it. She gave hers last week. Yeah. Oh, well, wow. it was actually two weeks ago. All right. And she thought she couldn't do it. I know. Yeah. She did fine. Yeah. And she did fine. She did. And we talked over it. She, it's like anything else. There's always a little bit of you got to round things out a little bit here. There's a few, a few yeah. little square edges, edges she needed, but she had all, the whole thing there. Right. Everything was there. Uh -huh. Everything else was just working on the organization of you had all the material. That's the, what the outline's for is to help you organize the material so that point one leads automatically into point two, and point two leads into point three. The logical flow. Yeah, because. The average person today is ignorant of the Bible. You used to be able to go up and tell someone, you could knock on a door and talk about David and Goliath, man, they knew. Oh, no sweat. And you know what they're going to tell you now? Yeah, my kid watched that cartoon last Saturday. Right. Because it's now a cartoon. Yeah. Yeah, it's on TV. Yeah, okay. Pastor Maybe. Stevenson, no, Pastor Stevenson, up in Washington, knocked on a door. A woman came to the door. He was talking to her, and uh, her son come, I guess, came within sight. And Pastor Stevenson said, "Oh, who's that? Oh, that's my son. Oh, what's his name?" She said, "John." He said, "Oh, that's a Bible name." She goes, "Oh, I'm sorry." Oh. <laughs> she did. She went, "Oh, oh, I'm sorry." Like, oh, I, I didn't mean to name him somebody out of the Bible. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like you just do. But you also you also have to watch how you say things to people because Pastor Stevenson was also the one. I think I've told it. I don't know. I have, told this story before in another class. He went into a Chinese restaurant. He was going to order some stuff to go, and the guy that ran the restaurant was Chinese, obviously. And I don't think he understood too much English. He understood enough to you know, run the restaurant. And Pastor Stevenson walked in, and the guy was, he had the cash register right there. Pastor Stevenson was talking to him. He said, mind if I ask you a question? Sure. If you were to die today, are you sure you go, oh, don't kill, don't kill. Put, put the cash register out, threw it on the counter, one mile to everybody, don't kill. He said, oh, no, no. But if you were, uh, are you sure you go, no, don't kill, don't kill. Yeah. Their money flew everywhere, all over the place. Yeah. 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 Stevenson did the only thing he could do. He ran out the door, got in his car, and drove off quick before anybody called the police. He thought he was a guy. Yeah, he, that guy thought he was going to get shot dead on the spot, and that's what Stevenson was going to take all the money. So we have to be careful how we phrase things with people, maybe from other cultures, or even from our culture. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know John the Bible name. So... Uh, this helps you put it in an organized procession so that the average person that doesn't understand the Bible can understand the biblical precept. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. Oh, that might be a sub point. Who is whosoever? That means anybody. Everybody. Whoever does it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. White, black, yellow, green, striped, male, female. Or even the bunch that don't know what they are anymore. <laughs> God still loves them. They're still whosoever. <laughs> even if they don't know, He knows what they are. And He doesn't care. Because they're neither Jew nor Greek. 
nor male, nor female, nor bond, nor free. So it doesn't matter what sex you are, what race you are, what ethnicity. I just had a discussion with a guy the other day, and uh, this particular guy, from time to time, he has to fill out things telling what his race is. He has to put Caucasian every time. He's Hispanic. Hispanic is not a race. It's an ethnicity. Right. If you're Hispanic, you have to put down your Caucasian. Mm -hmm. Now, what they do here in Utah, I know this, they'll put down white. <laughs> I won't check that. I won't check that box. Mm -hmm. And they, I have one ask me why. I said, because I'm not white, I'm pink. <laughs> so next to white, I'll write Caucasian mm -hmm. and put a circle around it or a check mark next to Caucasian because I'm not white. Right. I'm pink. I mean, does that look white? Yeah. Now that might look white because <laughs> the legs never see the light of day, they blind you, but you understand what I mean. And so we have to be careful, and especially in church when you have visitors come in, we may know what salvation means, but that last person has no idea. What does salvation mean? Well, I looked it up in the dictionary, and that means that guy that pulled me out from in front of that car that was backing out in the parking lot that was going to run over me. That's why the original dictionary had two words, two spellings for the word Savior. One of them had a U in it, and the other one did not. S-A-V-I-O-R. That could be the guy that saved you from drowning. Or the gal that, that uh, saved you from, you know, getting hit by a car. But S-A-V-I-O-U-R, it said Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yes. That was the definition of that word in the original dictionary. The original dictionary was written for one purpose, to standardize the spelling of God's Word in all of the printings of the Bible. If you look out there in the, that display case, some of those pages of the Bible, right. yeah. you're liable to find good spelled G-O-D, G-O-O-D-E. I've seen that one several times. Mm -hmm. G-O-O-D-E. Because there was no standardized spelling. And so the dictionary was so that all of the printings of the Bible would have standardized spelling. Not only that, when you see this, looks like almost like an F in the middle of a word. That's actually an S. Oh, yeah. S. You look at it, it looks like Pafons. Yeah. C-R-O-F-F-E. Yeah. Cross. C -R yeah. And so that's why they <laughs> had the dictionary, and that's why God... I believe God led the man to do that dictionary. Right. Why? Because there were so many different ways of spelling. Whatever the printer was, he spelled it the way he thought it should sound. I mean, the way he thought it sounded, that's the way he'd spell it. And so this is so that we can organize the thoughts for people that don't know anything about the Bible. And because they can understand if you put it in a progression. They can... When you get down to the conclusion, for God so loved the world, hey, that must mean me too. Why? Well, because you'd explained that already up there. The whosoever. Yeah. It's anybody. That means he loved you too. Right. Not only that, he showed it. Why? Because God commended his love toward us in that while we were still good people. No. 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 <laughs> while we were yet sinners. Christ died. I wonder how many people watching the live stream when I'm <laughs> preaching on when I do that, just to get you guys to tell me I'm wrong. Okay. I love it because I love feedback. I love getting people involved. Okay, But the purpose of this is so you can explain it in a logical progression that the average person can understand, even if they know nothing about the Bible. That's why it's called expository preaching. You're exposing what God is telling people here. What's in this verse? And that's just one verse. And like I said, I, I like to use 16 all the way to 19. You know, because uh, he sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. And then go into Romans 8. Yeah. So, don't make it more complicated than necessary, but everything you want to give in your speech, your illustrations, you might have an illustration as part of the introduction, or point one B might be a particular illustration. That's something in your own life. But I'll tell you something about illustrations. Never say anything publicly that you do not want the whole world to know. Right. I've had half a dozen preachers tell me, and members, 
like when I was up in Ogden, the, the guy that turned out to be the wolf. He said, you should never tell him stories about when you were a musician. I said, why? It's the best negative examples I can think of. Because I know exactly what happened because of how I lived at that time. He said, oh no, you should never tell him. And by the way, if you go down to Texas, in the Baptist churches down there, in many of the old-timey Baptist churches, the preacher has to be perfect. There are churches that would never let me up to preach because I don't have a white shirt on and I've got this type of jacket instead of just a suit jacket. Love your jacket. Yeah. yeah. If you if you wore a, a black shirt, any kind of color, they wouldn't let you up to preach because you got a yellow shirt on. Oh my God. Yeah. Wouldn't. You have to be in a white shirt. So you have like you have to dress woman. like us. You have to you have to walk like us. You have to talk you like have us. To look like a woman. <laughs> yeah, actually, <laughs> and you actually do. Yeah. yeah. Pastor Mayfield, my daddy in the Lord down there. He was out mowing the lawn at the parsonage. There was nobody else to do it. He was mowing the lawn. He had on, I don't think it was waders, but he had a high top. Mission boots, because he'd been bitten several times by a brown recluse. Mm -hmm. And the doctor told him, when you reach your tolerance, you're dead. Mm -hmm. there, there's no antidote for brown recluse venom. It actually rots the skin. Maybe the size of a dime or a nickel or whatever will rot in your skin, and that will fall out. Yeah, it'll fall right out. It'll just and they told him if you get bit again, you might die. Mm -hmm. So he had to wear those because they got a lot of brown recluse down there. But the guy across the fence was looking over the fence, and and of course he was ex Navy, so he just had on a sweatshirt and a cap, you know, working clothes. And the guy, who are you? He said, I'm the pastor. I thought you were the gardener. Whoa. He said, no, I'm the pastor of the church. <laughs> really? He said, the last pastor that was here used to mow the lawn in the leisure suit. Pastor Mayfield, Mayfield said, I ain't doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the guy couldn't believe that the pastor was actually out there in just a, you know, a cap and sweatshirt and mow the lawn with the waiter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because down there, the pastor is expected to be perfect. I'm sorry that they're not. Well, I'm sorry they're not going to have any pastors unless Jesus comes back from the dead right. and decides he's going to pastor that church because right. he's the only perfect one that ever lived on the face of the earth and ever will until right. he comes back. Yes. And so uh, this is just to help you relate God's word to people that know nothing about the Bible. And the average person today knows nothing. We can't assume when they come in the door that they have any idea who Jesus Christ even or John. Right. I mean, when they go, oh, I'm sorry. That's showing how ignorant people are of God's word. Mm -hmm. And that, well, if it's in the Bible, it must be a holy word. Oh. If it's a holy name, if it's in the Bible, and I don't want to offend God. Mm -hmm. Hey, before I was saved, my brother and I were sitting and we went to, I think it was someone's wedding or funeral. I don't remember which too many years ago. But we were saying, and our joke was, uh oh, watch it. What's the matter? Well, the building's starting to shake and I hope the ceiling doesn't yeah. fall in. That was a big joke. Yeah. 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 Heard it. And actually, I told the doctor this. No, it wasn't the doctor. It was the dietician at the hospital. I use this all the time. He came in, the dietician came in, and he was joking around. He was taking my order for, you know, what are you going to have for dinner or whatever. And they give you a menu. And uh, he said, what do you want to drink? you want a cocktail or a, or a, a, a Jim Beam on the rocks or something? I told him, I said, no, I'm a Baptist preacher. And if I drink, we'd probably both get hit by lightning. Yeah. And he just busted a gun over that one. He just, he just cracked up over that. I just wanted to let him know, Baptists don't drink. Yeah. Now, many of them do. You go down to Texas, you're going to find probably half, two-thirds of the Baptists drink. They don't get drunk, though. Oh. But I love, that's one thing, I love Pastor Mayfield's... The Holy liquor. No. He asked a guy, he said, uh, how many beers does it take you to get drunk? The guy said, oh, probably six or seven. He said, pick a number. Uh, seven. So it takes seven beers to get you drunk, right? He says, so that means if you drink one beer, you're one-seventh drunk, aren't you? 
Yeah. And really, if you think about it, isn't that logical? Yeah. If it takes seven to get you drunk, totally drunk, one beer will get you one seventh drunk. Because this guy says, well, I drink, but I never get drunk. Well, if, if you're one seventh drunk, I that'd be like saying you're one seventh pregnant. No, you either are or you ain't. I mean, there's no one seventh. It's the same way. You're either filled with wine or you're filled with the Holy Ghost like because Clinton. you're mutually exclusive. Or like Clinton, he smoked but didn't inhale. Yeah. I'll tell you what. I had friends that you, I never could because I was singing for a living and telling my throat out. But I had friends. And if if you're in the room where they're smoking dope, you're smoking dope. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're in the room, you're smoking. Right. That's the problem in Amsterdam when you walk down the street. There'll be seven or eight people standing on a corner smoking dope. And there's this big cloud of, cloud of smoke around. I mean, you walk by, man, and you're going, whoa, yeah, woo, because it's legal. It's, it's legal. Yeah, they smoke it right in public. In fact, many of the countries now are actually giving free needles and heroin to the addicts. Free needles so that they don't pass diseases around. And free heroin... So they don't go out and rob a store to get money to buy their heroin. Yeah. That's the big well, thing now. Those same company, five those or same ten countries years. are offering, are offering uh, programs for uh, rehabilitation to addicts that are yeah. whacked out on it. Yeah. And it's free. It's government. Okay. So to get back here, I'm just simply saying this allows you to communicate with people that know nothing about the Bible. Or if they know anything... They know it's called the Bible. <laughs> and if they saw, if were at grandma's, great, now it's not grandma's house anymore. If they were at great grandma's house, they might know it is called the Holy Bible. Because that's all they ever remember about it. Because it used to be grandma was the one that took them to church, but now, in this current generation, it was great grandma. They believe you in the cupboard. Yep. Yep. So, if I read the Bible, that ought, to, that ought to please God. He'd never send me to hell, because at least I'm reading his Bible. They can understand the words, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, their foolishness unto him, for they're spiritually discerned. They can understand the words, but they can't understand the meaning. Right. So this is to help them go through the words and explain the meaning to them. Okay, so we're out, we're out of time. Actually, this 25 after, according to that clock. Any other comments, uh, questions? All right, I want you all to make an outline. Okay, a new one. <laughs> Don't bring the old one. That's not nice. I, d- I never said that was nice. No, we didn't, we're not going to either. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> Make a new sermon. Let's see. Wait a minute. I thought I was teacher before friend in here. <laughs> I can be friend before teacher out there, but I got to be teacher before friend. You can't, be a, you can't be a parent and a friend at the same time. No, no. I saw that on something the other night. They were saying, "You're the parent. You're not their best friend. Yeah. You're their parent." This day and age, they want to be their friend. Well, they, and they think that that's that's how you raise a kid is be their best friend. But that, remember the illustration I've used many times, how do you clean up a pig? Do you take a bucket of water, a bar of soap, and a brush, and get down in the pig, pig pen and try to wash the pig down in the pig's sty? Uh, no, it's going to make things worse. Okay, tell us what you want different yeah, in this outline from the last one. Uh, you, uh, the specifics. Fifteen minutes. Mm. You want a fifteen-minute sermon? Yep. Because okay. I think yours was about six or seven. No, yours was five. about five. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, let's make it ten. Then. Okay, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll build up to fifteen. Yeah. Ten minute sermon <laughs> on. Uh, do you want to pick your own subject, or do you want me to give you a subject? Pick our own. Yeah, I'll pick my own. Pick your own. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you keep picking, Daniel, it's never going to heal. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, you can pick your own. Pick your own subject. Um, it can be one verse, like we did here, or you can do two or three, four, whatever. But I want it to be ten minutes long. Okay. 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 Got it. Got it. 
All right. Brother Joel, would you dismiss us in prayer? I've got a date with my wife, so Amen. for a cup of cocoa. Amen. We Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this time we can oh. spend in class. Lord, just thank you that the gave us safety to get in here, and please give us safety on our way home. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Are you going to do that tonight? Yeah. That's oh. what I told you at the start of the class. I thought you were going to do it during your You were class. engaged with your... Yeah, I'm trying to get the goofy thing to work. <laughs> the goofy thing to work. <laughs> yeah. Come My own head. Come by the kitchen. We're going to open up the... Matzos and car set. Car set. Car set. Car set. We like those. Car set. I need to get some. Oh, yeah, you do this all the time.